Hey everyone, today is part three of our series, Choose to Lose. We're also wrapping things up today, and to get things kicked off, I am going to ask a question that bothers me quite a bit personally. And, and when I say this, this issue bothers me, I don't mean it's annoying to me. I mean, no, really, th- this is troubling to me as an individual. And, and the question I have, the issue I want to raise today is this, why is it that in America, a nation that has traditionally labeled itself as being a Christian nation. Why is it that today Christian beliefs and values are largely ignored or considered repressive or outdated by most of our country? Well, why is it that today in our country the Christian church is at best considered irrelevant and at worst considered repressive, judgmental, homophobic, irrelevant. Now, when I ask uh, pastors, clergy, this very same question, almost always the same answer I get is, well, that's just the world we live in. It's just those evil, wicked sinners out there that hate God, you know? I, can't, I just can't go along with that answer. As, as I've studied world history, as I've studied the biblical perspective on history, with every single page of history that I read, what I am, am led to as a conclusion is that the world has always been hostile to God. The, the world has always been filled with people who do evil, who, who turn away from God, who, who do not want to submit to the will of God. That is nothing new. It's not as if Americans have suddenly invented evil. Okay? It's always, always plagued the sinful human being. I think the reason why, perhaps the the main reason why the church is the way it is and Christian beliefs and values are viewed the way they are in our country today has to do with the fact that the church has to do with the fact that the Christians have either stopped believing or stopped practicing something that Jesus himself taught about what it means to be a Christian. We have stopped believing or stopped practicing what Jesus said is fundamental to being a disciple, a follower, a believer in Jesus. Now, today we're going to be looking at something that's a little bit uncomfortable, to be honest. In fact, that, that's what this whole series has been. We had to keep this series to three weeks. Like, if we go four weeks, no one's coming back. Uh, we've been looking at uncomfortable truth, and most of us, we, we, we avoid uncomfortable situations. That's mo- how most of us are hardwired. There's a few people who love conflict and, and weird situations. Most of us, we don't like to be uncomfortable. It's why you don't start the diet. You know you should start. It's why you avoid the difficult conversation. You know you need to have. It's why you're so glad winter is almost over. We just don't like being uncomfortable, but in the first two weeks of this series, Dan showed us some uncomfortable truth. The truth is that although being a follower of Jesus will give you everything, it will also cost you everything at the same time. If, if you become a Christian, if you have faith in Christ, if you trust Him, He has so much to give you. He, and forgiveness is just the start of it. He gives you an identity as a child of God. He gives you God's unconditional acceptance. He gives you the assurance that God will never leave you or forsake you. He gives you a promise of eternal life in heaven because everybody spends eternal, eternity somewhere. We believe that at Hope. But following Jesus is also going to cost you everything. Uh, Dan said last week, you, he calls you to take up your cross and follow him. What that means is you put to death self, selfish pride, selfish ambition, self-serving motivation, things that build my kingdom and my identity and my purpose around me and my accomplishments rather than God's kingdom. Being a Christian gives everything. It also costs everything of self at the same time. Today, what we're going to talk about is how people make that transition. How do people who become Christians, once they become Christians, transition from, hey, this is great, I get a lot out of being a Christian, to the point where they say, and I'm gladly sacrificing everything to follow Jesus. Now, here's why I think this topic is worth the price of your attention today. First of all, for those of you who already consider yourselves Christians and say, yes, I have faith in Jesus as my Savior. Here's why I think this is worth the price of your attention. There will be a point when you get to your last day in this life. There will be a point where your one life to live is over. Because as sands through the hourglass, so are the days of your life. And when you're in your deathbed surrounded by all your children in some general hospital, 
you are going to suddenly realize that's it. I'm done. I'm, I'm cashing in my chips. My, my, my turn is over. I'm handing over the dice. I used my turn up. No redos, no mulligans. Your life has been lived. At that point, what along the way will have made your life matter? What along the way will have maximized your ability to make not just a temporary but also an eternal difference in life? That's what we're going to talk about today. For those of you who are not Christians yet, I think this is worth the price of your attention and here's why. Some of you, the reason why you do not believe is because you've known too many people who call themselves Christians. You've known people who go to church, they say they follow Jesus, but their lives don't look any any different than anybody else's life. In fact, you look at them and you don't respect them, you don't want to emulate them, and you say, if that's what it means to be a Christian, I don't think I want to be one. And that's been one of your very legitimate hang-ups to taking Jesus seriously. Today, what I want to show you is that is not what Jesus said about what it means to be a follower, what it means to be a Christian who follows him. Today, to look at this transition to becoming a man or becoming a woman who sacrifices, who follows Jesus, who makes a difference in this world, we're going to be looking at two places in a place in the Bible we call the book of John. Uh, There are four men who wrote biographies of the life of Jesus. John was one of them. We're going to look at the very first chapter and the very last chapter of his summary of the life of Jesus. And in these two chapters, we're going to see Jesus talking to and surrounded by the same men, once at the beginning of his ministry, once at the end of his ministry. And in studying these two cases, we're going to see how it is that a person makes this transition to becoming someone who not just wants to consume things from our world and from the people around him and from God himself, but a person who is a contributor and makes a difference and follows Jesus wholeheartedly and passionately. That's the transition we're going to look at today. So to begin, we're going to start with John chapter 1, uh, verse 35. It's in your notes if you're taking notes. You can uh, fill in the blanks there when we get there. It says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Now, the John mentioned here is not the same guy, John, who wrote this book of the Bible. Uh, this is a guy that we sometimes call John the Baptist. Uh, this isn't like, hey, there's Joe the Catholic and there's John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a guy whose purpose, his mission, his calling in life was to get people ready to meet Jesus. He was a few months older than Jesus. God said, John, you're going to go get people ready for Jesus. He did that by saying to people, hey, you've got sin. You need to repent and be baptized. He kind of brought the whole baptism thing. And, and, and then he turned their attention to Jesus to follow Jesus as the Messiah. So John was out. He was in the sticks. He was in the middle of nowhere. He was in the Jordan River wilderness. And people were coming from all over the place to hear his sermons, to be baptized, to, to, to become his disciples and his followers, um, the, the best illustration I can use to explain what this would be like today is imagine there is some crazy wild-eyed preacher in Exonia and people are coming from Madison, they're coming from Milwaukee, they're coming from Chicago just to hear this guy preach and people are saying, we're joining your church, we just want to hear what you have to say. That's kind of the scenario that John was in and he had followers, he had disciples, When he saw Jesus, this is John, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. And that might not mean a lot to you, but it meant a lot to these two disciples. These Jewish men understood the Old Testament Jewish sacrificial system. Lambs were used to offer as a substitutionary payment for their sin. If someone sinned, they would take a lamb to the temple, the priest would sacrifice it as a substitute for their sin. When John says there's the Lamb of God, he's pointing at Jesus as being the Messiah, the one who's here to pay for the sin of the world, the one who's here to give his life in payment for the sins of the world. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now for John, that was a win. He didn't want them to follow him. He wanted them to follow Jesus because John followed Jesus. They're going to follow Jesus now. Mission accomplished for John. The story continues. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Now, it's kind of interesting. Jesus is just kind of walking on his way. All of a sudden, there's two guys following him like this. He turns around. Well, what, what do you guys want? Very penetrating question, and here's why. In that generation, there were all kinds of ideas about what a Messiah would be and what a Messiah would do when he actually showed up. Jesus is saying, what kind of Messiah are you looking for? 
What kind of Savior are you looking for? What kind of salvation are you seeking? Because they were seeking political salvation. They were seeking military salvation. They were seeking, seeking financial salvation. He's like, what, what kind of Messiah are you guys looking for? They don't even know how to answer. They say rabbi, which means teacher, which means, hey, um, John, we follow John. John said follow you, so we're just going to follow you. We don't even know what kind of Messiah you are. Where are you staying? We're, we're, we're just going to follow you, like it or not, here we are. So wherever you're staying, we're going to stay there. Now look at how Jesus responded. This is amazing. Come, he replied, and you will see. The reason why this is amazing is he doesn't begin with a theology quiz. He doesn't begin by saying, well, let's see what John taught you and I'll see if you can enter the school of Jesus. Let's see where you measure up in terms of your Bible knowledge. Let's see where you measure up in terms of your lifestyle. Let's talk about how good you are. Let's talk about if you've repented enough. Jesus doesn't do any of that. Here's two guys showing up. They, they say, Jesus, we just want to find out who you are. Jesus said, all right, come on. You want to find out who I am? You want to see what kind of Messiah, what kind of Savior I am? If you come, you will See, story continues, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. That's his hometown. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Now, the reason why John includes almost this parenthetical note, oh, by the way, Philip was from the same hometown as Andrew and Peter, is because Andrew and Peter were already following Jesus. And so when they come along with Jesus and Jesus says, Philip, follow me, it's easier for Philip to say, okay, I'll come check all this out. Not only has he probably heard Jesus preached, his friends are following Jesus too. What John is telling us here is that the gospel naturally flows through relationships. Most people become Christians through relationships. They know someone who's following Jesus and they begin to follow Jesus for themselves. What this means is for us today, Unfortunately, our church is getting to the size where people are just starting to come because they hear about it. I think faith, and if that's why you're here, we're glad you're here, but I think faith grows best when you have some friends who are Christians and they're following Jesus, and, 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 and we're structured to help you do that. I'll tell you about that in a little bit, how we're structured to help you find those friends. But faith grows best when we have Christian relationships with one another. That's how the gospel spreads from person to person to person. Philip begins to follow Jesus, and his first question for following Jesus is this, can I bring a friend too? He wants to bring someone along, so here's what happens. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip runs off, he finds his buddy Nathaniel. He goes, Nathaniel, guess what? Nathaniel's like, what? We found him. We, we, we found who? We found who? We found the Messiah. The Messiah, yeah, yeah. You know the one 15 centuries ago, Moses said there's going to be a Savior and, and the prophet said there's going to be a Savior and we've been waiting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for a Messiah. Yeah, we found him. The Pharisees didn't find him, the rabbis didn't find him, the smart people didn't find him, the religious people didn't find him, Rome didn't find him. We found him. Now, imagine how that would sound to Nathaniel. You found the Messiah, Philip. I mean, come on, we, we, we drink beer at the lake together. You, you found the Messiah, Philip. Are you kidding me? And then, of course, Philip said something he never should have said. He's Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And, and I can almost imagine him going, oh, shouldn't have said that. Here's why. Next, next verse. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Now, here's what's interesting. Historically, we know that in the first century, Nazareth didn't have the best reputation, but we're really not sure why. I mean, it, it was impoverished. It was fairly uneducated, but there were other places like that in Israel. For whatever reason, people just kind of look down at Nazareth. Insert local hick town here that you choose to, to figure that out. It just wasn't looked well upon. So he says, really, you found the Messiah. The smart people didn't find him, you found him, and by the way, he's from Nazareth, okay? Bethlehem, yeah, Jerusalem, maybe, Nazareth, no, a Messiah can't come from Nazareth. Now, Philip does something genius here. He doesn't engage in an argument about whether or not a Messiah could come from Nazareth. 
it would be easy for him to get into a big theological debate about whether or not it's possible, improbable maybe, but is it possible for a Messiah to come from Nazareth? He doesn't even engage him on the topic. Instead, he does something that Christians have been doing for centuries when it comes to getting to the issue, when it comes to introducing someone to Christianity. He says, come and see. Come and see. But you said he's from Nazareth. No, come and see. But no, Messiah can't be from Nazareth. Listen, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if a Messiah can come from Nazareth. Just, just come and see. Well, well, I've got some objections and I've got some hang-ups to following Jesus as a Messiah. Fine, listen, right, you're probably right, fine. I don't know if a Messiah can come from Nazareth. He probably can't. Listen, I don't even know if Jesus is the Messiah, but would you just do yourself a favor and would you just come and see? In fact, I'm your friend. Do me a favor as your friend. You just come and see and then when you meet Jesus, you can decide for yourself what category do you want to put him into. You can decide if he's a Messiah or not for yourself. I don't want to argue with you about whether or not he's from Nazareth. I don't know. You're probably right. Would you just come and see? That's the genius of Philip. He knows Nathaniel has objections. He knows Nathaniel has hang-ups. He knows Nathaniel has doubts about whether or not Jesus could possibly be the Messiah. Philip does him the biggest favor of his life and says, fine, you, tell you what, you grab your Nazareth question, you bring it along, and you can bring it to Jesus and meet him. You just need to come and see whether or not he's the Messiah. And here's our first fill-in-the-blank if you're taking notes today. Following Jesus begins with come and see. It always begins with come and see. You say, Jason, you, you have no idea who you're talking to. I have so many doubts and objections to Christianity. Okay. You, you can have all the doubts in the world and you're still welcome at this church. Just bring them along. Come, come, come meet Jesus. Bring your doubts in hand and come Meet Jesus. Now, next week is Easter Sunday. And, and at Hope, we love, we love Easter Sunday. It's, it's the biggest day of the year for us. It's, it's the day Jesus rose from death. It's the day that is the hinge upon which everything we believe and hope for as Christians hangs, the resurrection of Jesus from death. And, and there is something about the resurrection that throughout history, every year, the power of Jesus' resurrection still reverberates where people who are not even Christians, who have all kinds of doubts and all kinds of hang-ups and all kinds of uncertainties, are still willing to come to church on Easter Sunday, do them a favor. Bring them next week to church. We're going to start a brand new series. You'll be glad you brought them. Invite them to come and see. They say, but, but you know I'm not a Christian. Well, I know, I know. Just come and see. But, but you know I'm not a church person. I would never ask you to become a church person. Just come and see. Just come and see on Easter Sunday. People begin to follow Jesus not when they get every single question answered. They begin when they come and see. Verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. Now, you know why this is awesome? Jesus sees Nathanael coming with his doubts, with his reservations, with his objections. And how does Jesus respond to that? He says, I like this guy. He says what's on his mind. He states his opinions. I like Nathaniel. You're welcome here. Some of you, perhaps you've been in a church where when you stated your reservations or your doubts, you were told, well, just believe it's in the Bible. And you didn't think there was room in Christianity for you to have doubts. Jesus isn't intimidated by your doubts. He's not scared by them. He's not put off by them. You can bring all of your objections. You can bring them all to Jesus. And he says, I like you. You really speak what's in your heart. Here's a true person in whom there's nothing false. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. So he's like, yeah, that's who I am. I just speak my mind. How do you know that about me? Nathaniel's curious now. Jesus says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now, here's the point where Nathaniel's eyes get wide. 
Here's the point where Nathaniel, his doubts about whether or not a Messiah can be from Nazareth, they don't get answered, but all of a sudden the objection shrinks down really small. It says, Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Now, I don't know what Nathaniel was doing under that fig tree. John doesn't tell us. But whatever it was, the fact that Jesus said, I saw you under that fig tree, it made Nathanael drop to his knees in worship. You are the Messiah. You are the King of Israel. You're the Son of God. You're the one we've been waiting for. Now, did he ever get his question about Nazareth answered? Can a Messiah come from Nazareth? I don't know if he got that question answered. Not there he didn't. But when he came to see Jesus, when he came to meet Jesus, his objection suddenly melted down real small. And he said, here's Jesus, here's a real person. Some of you listening today, you've got some real valid reasons why you don't think you can embrace Christianity. I understand that. You've got some real legitimate hang-ups. Hey, can, can the Bible be right when it says the world was created in six days? Was there really a flood? Did all the animals actually fit on the ark? Was Jesus really born of the virgin? Can someone walk on water? Jesus is nice, but surely there's other ways to heaven. Are you trying to tell me about someone in Africa who's never heard of Jesus? Well, what's going to happen to that person if Jesus is the way? You've got all kinds of hang-ups, all kinds of objections, and, and I, I think they're good questions. I really do. And I don't want you to dismiss them. That wouldn't be honest. I want to challenge you to come and, and just bring them to Jesus. To come and see Jesus. To come and meet Jesus. But for some of you, if I can pry a little bit, you say you have intellectual objections to Christianity, but the truth is, that's just a smokescreen. You actually have emotional objections to Christianity because you've got some things going on in your heart right now that you think are wrong. And you don't need the preacher to tell you. You don't need the Bible to tell you. You would already say those things are sin. Those things are wrong. And if you become a Christian, if you begin to follow Jesus, you're afraid of what that would mean in terms of your relationships, in terms of your habits, in terms of things going on in your world. And so you have some emotional objections for becoming a Christian. And maybe you just throw up the smokescreen objections of, 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 the, of the logical reasons why you don't think you can become a Christian. You know that. And if you wanted to talk with a pastor here or some other Christian, we could walk through all your objections. I promise you there's answers. There, the Bible has so many answers. But at the end of it, you wouldn't be any closer to God because all we did was talk about your objections. We want you to come and meet Jesus. Now, when an adult becomes a Christian, it's kind of like when a young man gets married. Now, have you ever known a young man, 19, 20, 21, 22, right around that stage of life, and all of a sudden one of his buddies gets married, and all of a sudden that buddy is gone, right? He can't do anything anymore. They, they can't hang out anymore because he got married and he goes... Pfft. He's whipped, right? And, you know, and then, then he says this, well, I'm never going to get married. I'll tell you that right now. And if you could ask that young man, well, how come you're rejecting the category of marriage? He would say, oh, I've got all kinds of objections why I'm never going to get married. I'll go out when I want to go out. I want to come home when I want to come home. Uh, I don't have enough money to do everything I want to do to say nothing of, of affording a wife. And then he'll go down all these objections, all these hang-ups, all these reasons why marriage is not for him, why he has rejected the category of marriage. And then one day, this young man who has rejected this category meets a young lady and her name is Mary and he falls in love with Mary and he's dating Mary and next thing you know he gets engaged to Mary to get married to Mary you say oh so he, he worked through all his objections <laughs> no he didn't if you've ever been married he's going to spend the next seven years working through his objections but he's still going to get married why because all of a sudden in his past marriage was a category suddenly it became a person suddenly it became a relationship and his objections were still there but they just got smaller when they were brought into the presence of the person and he brought all of his objections and all of his doubts and all of his hang-ups into marriage. And then he'll work through them. He'll figure them out. 
but it's about Mary, not about marriage. When adults become Christians, we've got hang-ups, we've got objections, we've got questions, and we can talk about those. We've even got environments to talk about those, but I'm telling you, it's not until you come and meet Jesus. Because Christianity is not a category. Christianity is about a relationship. It is personal. It is about Jesus the Savior. That all of your objections get real small and Christianity stops being a category and it starts being about a person. Jesus, the Son of God. Now, here's what's really interesting. When Nathaniel gives this statement of faith, Jesus, you're the Messiah. I'm going to follow you. Jesus is critical now towards Nathaniel. Check this out. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? Nathaniel, <laughs> where's your skepticism, buddy? You are believing way too easily. You, you are believing for something. I, I, just, I just said I saw you and you're believing? Mm-mm, you're believing too easily. He says, you will see greater things than that. He says, you want to believe I'm the Messiah? Let me tell you the real reason why you should believe I'm the Messiah. He then added, very truly. Now, this is a very interesting phrase. In Aramaic, it was the word amen. He said, amen, amen. If you have an old translation of the Bible, it says, verily, verily, which, which doesn't mean anything to us. Um, what, what's interesting, in the first century world, in the synagogues, when, when, when the rabbi or someone would stand up and preach or read the Bible, and um, the, the men in the synagogue, they would all say, amen, when he finished reading. And in fact, if you grew up in more of a Southern a Baptist or a Pentecostal kind of background, the preacher preached preaches and he makes a good point, you guys will say, hmm, amen, you know, kind of grumble that amen kind of thing. Jesus, he's interesting because in that culture, first you say the good thing, then other people amen you. Jesus has the audacity to come along. I'm about to say something, but before I say it, I'm going to amen it. In fact, I'm going to double amen it. It's going to be that good. Today, we don't use that as much. Here's what we do. This would be like saying, I'm about to say something really cool. Get your phones out. You're going to want to tweet this. Are you ready? Okay, that's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, very truly, I tell you. So get ready. This is going to be good. You, Nathaniel, will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And you guys got your phones out. You're like, I don't get it. He said this is going to be good. I don't get it. What do you mean? Well, here's, here's what he's saying. Nathaniel would have gotten this. Because Jesus is quoting something from the book of Genesis, which Nathaniel would have known very well. He's quoting an incident from the life of a guy by the name of Jacob. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob got his brother Esau so mad at him, Esau wanted him dead, and he literally had to flee for his life. He runs away from home. He's running to a different country. At the end of the day, he's exhausted. He has to set up some kind of makeshift camp. Um, He doesn't even have a pillow. He just grabs a rock, and he uses that for his pillow. He falls asleep. While he's asleep, he has a dream. You can read about it in Genesis. In the dream, he sees a staircase going from earth to heaven. At the top of the staircase is God himself, and there's angels ascending and descending on the staircase in his dream. And in the dream, God says to Jacob, Jacob, I am your God. I will bless you. I will bring you back to the land of promise. I will be with you. Then Jacob wakes up, realizes it's a dream, realizes God's blessed him. He said, this is a holy place, calls the place Bethel, which means house of God, anoints the pillow, the stone pillow he was sleeping on with oil, goes on his journey. You read his story, later on he does come back to the promised land. What Jesus is doing is he's quoting this event from the life of Jacob that Nathaniel knew about. And he said, Nathaniel, you're going to see something better than me telling you I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see heaven open, God himself at the top, and the angels will be ascending and descending on. This is where it gets interesting. Not a staircase. There's not going to be a staircase to heaven. There's not going to be a ladder to heaven. Nathaniel, they're going to be ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Son of Man was the term Jesus used more than any other term to refer to himself. Here's what he's saying to Nathaniel. Don't believe because I did a miracle. Don't believe because I said I saw you under the fig tree. I'm going to give you the real reason why you should believe in me as the Savior. Nathaniel, you're going to see heaven open up, and what you're going to see is that I am the staircase to heaven. 
I am the way into the presence of God the Father. I am the way to heaven. I am the truth. I am the life, Nathaniel. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am inviting you to come and see, and I am not inviting you to come and see that I will make your life better. I am not inviting you to come and see that you'll be healthy and wealthy and wise if you follow me. I am inviting you to see that I myself am the staircase to heaven, to the presence of God, and that's exactly what Jesus went on to show Nathaniel. When he died on the cross, he died to remove the obstacle of sin, the thing that divides heaven from earth, the thing that divides us from the presence of God. And Jesus bridged the gap with his own life, with his own blood, and he became the staircase for Nathaniel, for us to enter God's presence. When you are invited to come and see Jesus, you are invited to come and see that he gives you access. He gives you welcome into the presence, into the blessing of a Father in heaven who has promised to take you to a promised land in eternity. Jesus is saying, if you want to believe, that's the reason why you should believe. That's what I'm inviting you to come and see. But once you do, nothing will ever be the same again. Once you come and see that Jesus is the way back to God, nothing will ever be the same again. Because once you come and once you see, there's a transition that takes place in your heart and there's a transition that takes place in your life. And here's what it is. Come and see. Transitions to go and die. The invitation to come and see, once you come and see, transitions in to go and die. Now, to show you this, we're going to go to the last chapter of John's Gospel. Chapter 21. Let me briefly paint the context for you. Jesus has now died on the cross. He has now been resurrected on Easter Sunday. We estimate this is about a week after the resurrection that this next event takes place. The disciples, these same guys, Peter, Andrew, Philip, Nathaniel, they've already seen Jesus at least twice, maybe more. They're waiting to see him again. Peter says, well, I'm getting bored waiting for Jesus to show up. I'm going fishing. The other guys say, well, we'll go fishing too. They go out on their boats. All of a sudden, Jesus shows up on shore. He calls to them. They come rushing back in. Uh, He's got a fire going. They eat some breakfast. And after breakfast, Jesus has some words to say to them. And specifically, he has some words to say to Peter at this point. Here's what happens in John chapter 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now, the reason why Jesus asked this question is this. Before he was crucified, he warned the disciples, you will all fall away. Peter said, you know what? Even if all these other bozos fall away, not me, Jesus. Mm -mm. I am your number one fan. I am your number one disciple. They'll all run away. Not me. It's you and me to the end. I'll die for you, Jesus. Then, of course, Peter ran away like everyone else. And it was worse for Peter because he then went on to deny that he even heard of Jesus. When a teenage girl asked him, hey, weren't you with Jesus? He said, I I, I don't even know the blankety-blank man, he said denying that he knew Jesus. Now Jesus shows up, he's offered him forgiveness, and Peter is just absolutely crushed into the ground. He was such a failure as a disciple of Jesus. Now, Jesus is bringing him back to his point of epic failure when he asks, do you truly love me more than these? You said you love me more than everybody else. Do you really? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Feed my lambs. He continues. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Happens again. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs sheep. What's Jesus doing here? Three times, by the way, we could just preach on these verses for another two hours. Anybody game? 
No? No? Okay. Real quick overview. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus is reinstating him three times. Do you love me? He, just as he denied him, he's giving him three chances to affirm, I love you, I love you, I love you. And every time, Jesus doesn't say, well, good, go do something amazing for me. What does he say? Feed my sheep, feed my lamb, feed my sheep. He's clearly talking about his believers. He's talking about the church. Why does he call the church sheep? Why does he call the church lambs? The reason why is in the first century world, being a shepherd was not an awesome career. It wasn't something people aspired to become. It was for people who couldn't make it in the city. It was for people who weren't educated. It was for people who didn't have a lot of career options. Go take care of sheep then. What he's saying to Peter is, if you really love me, it's not about you anymore, Peter. Before you were close to me because you thought you could ride my coattails into fame. And your faith was really in yourself about how you would be strong, how you would be bold, how you would make a bold testimony for me, and then you failed you because your faith was in you. Now that you've been humbled, now that you know you are an absolute failure and I still unconditionally love you, now that you know you are an absolute failure and I still unconditionally forgive you, pour that out. Pour that love for me out in feeding my sheep, in doing work with your life that isn't about what you're going to get out of it, but it's about self-sacrifice, taking care of those who are lower, those who are lowly, those who aren't going to give you fame by being associated with them. There seems to be nothing to gain in return. Feed my sheep. And he's not done yet. I tell you the truth. This is another tweetable moment. Amen, amen. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. The tradition handed down to us tells us that Peter, like Jesus, was sentenced to be crucified. And Jesus is telling Peter here, right at the get-go, Just so you know, I'm going to let you know how this ends for you, Peter. You're going to be crucified like I was crucified. You are going to be put to death like I was put to death. You are going to go through excruciating pain like I was put through excruciating pain. Then he said to him, Follow me. Jesus doesn't order him to go out and do something. He says, no, all I want you to do is follow me. I gave my life for you. Follow me. I sacrificed everything for you. Followed me. I am now returning to the heavenly country. Follow me. Now that Peter knows he is an epic failure, now Jesus is ready to put him in charge of the church. Now that Peter has completely let Jesus down, now he's ready to become the leader of the apostles. If you read the book of Acts, Peter's name is mentioned more than any other name. He's always listed as first among the disciples. He's always looked to as the leader of the apostles and the leader of the church. Why does Jesus take the guy who's the biggest failure and put him in charge? Because only people who know that they're the biggest failures are suitable for service and following Jesus. If you come to Jesus and you think you don't have failure, you don't have sin, there's nothing that you're ashamed of, there's nothing that you feel guilty of, Jesus isn't going to put you in charge of ministry. He puts in ministry people who know they have failed and who trust in Christ and are dependent on Him and are now because of that ready to follow Him where He went. He says, follow me. Now, let's wrap this up with some summary points and we'll be done. First summary point is this. Jesus calls you in to send you out. He calls you in to send you out. Do you know how long it takes to become a Christian? Do you know how long it takes to get all your sins forgiven? Do you know how long it takes to become a child of God and an heir of eternal life? About two seconds, all right? Jesus died for you, I believe. In! That's it. There's no, the only precondition for Christianity is knowing you need a Savior, knowing you need forgiveness. 
knowing you need a staircase to get back to God. That's what Jesus is. But following Jesus will take the rest of your life. And he calls you in freely to send you out to sacrifice. And that is a lifelong pursuit to which he calls us following him. Second point is this, it's related. A meaningful life is not found in consuming, but in following. We are taught in American culture that your purpose for being on the planet is to consume. So you are marketed to, to consume. You are peer pressured into consuming. All of life is focused on consuming in our American culture. And when we buy into that, we become greedy and we assume everything that comes my way is here for me to consume now or it's here for me to consume later. But it is all about my consumption. My money, my stuff, my reputation, my job title, my house, all of it, it's for my consumption. Jesus says, it's all forfeit. Everything you consume and want to consume, you're going to lose it all. You're going to die. You're going to leave it behind. The world's going to burn up at some point anyway. It's all going to be lost. Meaning is not found in consuming. Now, you already know this. You don't admire greedy people. You admire generous people. A meaningful life is not found in consuming. It is found in following and living like Jesus, serving like Jesus, sacrificing like Jesus. Now, in your life as an individual, this will take almost infinite forms. You'll have almost infinite opportunities to follow Jesus practically, serving like Him, living like Him, giving like Him, loving like Him. Here as a local church, we've identified four specific ways that we want everyone who's a part of hope to follow Jesus. Four very practical ways, four very practical behaviors that help all of us follow Jesus and make an impact as a local church. The first thing we ask everyone to do at Hope as you follow Jesus is this, connect in a group. You know why we do that? Because we want you to invest in the lives of other people. We want you to serve other people. We want you to pray for other people. We want you to support other people One of the most practical ways you can follow Jesus is by feeding His lambs, encouraging other Christians. We want you to do that in a group. And we believe that what happens in groups is more important than what happens here on Sunday. I really believe that. Faith grows in the context of these healthy Christian relationships where Christians sacrifice for one another. We want you to connect in a group. Second thing is this, we want you to bring a friend. We want you to bring a friend to come and see, to come and meet Jesus so that they can know that there is a God in heaven who loves them and there is a way back to him and it is through Jesus. Bring a friend to come and meet Jesus. Third thing is this, we want you to give a percentage. Whatever income you have, give a percentage. I knew the church was about my money. I didn't say to the church, give a percentage of whatever you have to kingdom of God, Christian ministry, and to charity. Okay, to the degree you think hope is doing a good job with that, great, give a percentage to hope. But give a, not a dollar amount, whatever God gives you, give a percentage back. That honors Him. That is following Jesus' example. That is being someone who follows Him. Know what percentage you give away, give it away. Last thing is this, join a team. We want you to get involved in ministry here at Hope. We want you to join a team of other men and women just like you who are involved in ministry and are serving. Now, if you are not currently serving on a team in Hope, I'm going to show you five different areas where you can sign up today, Sunday, 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 and get plugged in to meaningful ministry here at Hope. Here they are. If you're taking notes, if you're not volunteering, we need three people to help in Kids Connect. Kids Connect is the amazing ministry going on right now across the hallway for kids from age two through fourth grade where they are connecting with God at their level and their faith in God is growing. You say, I don't teach kids. We don't need you to teach kids. We need you to do different roles, interacting with kids, playing with kids, loving kids and wanting to feed Jesus lambs and serve them. You do have to pass a criminal background check. I should probably just throw that one in there right now. If you want to watch our kids, we're going to check you out. But we want you to make a meaningful impact at their very young age in the entire trajectory of their lives and teach them the love of God. So we want three people in Kids Connect. We want two people in support services. Support services are the amazing people who set up this entire environment. You might have forgotten we're in a middle school. The Cyclone Country is your first clue that we're in a middle school. But they transform this school into a church and then turn it back and it all happens in about four hours on a Sunday. 
Four and a half hours. I went into theology. I'm not good at math. But we need two more people who can say, I can show up. I can set up a stage. I, I, I can set up curtains and chairs. I can do all that. Great. We need two people for that. Another opportunity. Guest services. We're looking for four people who can smile, who can welcome our guests, who can say, hey, we're glad you're here, and let all of our guests know that you are valued and you are so welcomed here. We care about you because God cares about you. But we have to communicate that strategically, which means we need people who are willing to be out there on the front lines welcoming people in and saying, we're glad you're here, and sharing that with them very clearly. We also need uh, two more people for parking crew. Those are the awesome people out there smiling, waving you in, showing you where to park your car. That is so powerful and welcoming people onto our campus here on Sunday morning. We're also looking for two people for audio and lighting. People who can you know, turn on the lights and run stuff like that. You say, I don't know how to do that. Well, we'll train you how. We'll train you how to do all this stuff. But listen, here's what I'm asking. If you're not volunteering, stop by the volunteer table on your way out today and said, okay, I'm supposed to start volunteering. Where can I get involved? Here's why. We're going to ask you every month for four to eight hours of your time. We're going to ask you to do it through the end of June so you can see if it's meaningful for you. And with your four to eight hours of time every month, you, listen, you are going to sacrifice yourself because everybody spends eternity somewhere. And you will be part of an amazing team of some of the most generous people in this community who are investing their lives and making an eternal impact for someone else. We want you to join a team. Stop by the volunteer table. Get plugged in on a team. Make a difference. Last thing today is this. You are going to die. It's easy to forget that. As obvious as it is, you are going to die. Finish well. Leave a legacy. Follow Jesus. In that, your life has meaning and value that is greater than you. Your glory is too small a thing to live for. Follow Him. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, thank you for preserving these words for us. Thank you that we can read from the life of Nathaniel and, and Peter and these disciples about what it looks like to follow you. Jesus, thank you for, for not being offended by our objections. Thank you for not being offended by our hang-ups and our doubts and our concerns about Christianity. Thank you that you didn't make it about a category, but you made it about knowing you and trusting you because you are the one who loves us and forgives us and welcomes us back into God's presence. Father, for those listening today and they're still on the outside of Christianity, I ask that the only thing they would leave with today is knowing that your son Jesus died for them and they are welcomed and affirmed by you through his sacrifice for their sins. I ask for everyone who's come and seen that you are good and you are gracious that we will shed our consumeristic culture and we will be men and women who lead lives that matter, following Jesus, sacrificing for the sake of his kingdom, and in that our lives will have purpose and meaning and value. Father, I ask that all of us would have the wisdom to know what to do with this truth and that we would have the courage to live it out in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.